Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about muscle contraction and relaxation. Okay, so muscle contraction. Um, so we just talked about, in the last video, we talked about um, what happens at the neuromuscular junction that triggers an action potential in the muscle. So now we're going to talk about what happens after that. Um, so acetylcholine triggers an action potential in the muscle that travels along the sarcolemma and through the transverse tubule system. Okay, so that action potential is traveling along the perimeter at the sarcolemma, and then that's the whole point of the T-tubules is that they help uh, the ions travel in a transverse direction to the deeper myofibrils of the muscle um, to carry that action potential to the depths of the muscle, not just along the surface. Uh, causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open throughout the muscle fiber. And remember, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is storing calcium ions for when there is an action potential. So there are all these calcium ions that are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so then when the action potential arrives, it causes them to open and just release a flood of those uh, calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. So now we have calcium ions flooding the muscle. That calcium goes uh, to all the myofibrils down to the, um, the thin filaments of the sarcomeres. And the calcium binds with the troponin, the little latches, and causes them to unlatch. So it allows the tropomyosin to move aside, which exposes the myosin binding sites. So remember, whenever the myosin binding sites are exposed, the myosin heads will grab on and form cross bridges. So it requires the use of ATP. So using ATP, adenosine triphosphate, uh, the myosin heads bind the binding sites on the actin to form cross bridges. And then there's a power stroke. So they form the cross bridge, they grab on, and then power stroke, essentially they grab on and then they pull, and that is the power stroke. Um, so the cross bridge rotates or swivels to move the proteins like rowing a boat. So they'll grab on and pull, and then using ATP, the myosin heads will detach. And if there is still an action potential, or action potentials, plural, arriving at the muscle, then it will detach and grab and pull again. So we'll have multiple cross bridge cycles with our uh, power stroking occurring so that the, the sarcomere is going from here to here to here to here to here with each power stroke. So one power stroke does not cause full contraction of a sarcomere. It's really um, constant um, action potentials causing multiple power strokes to happen one after another to cause the sarcomere to continually shorten until it gets to its shortest length. So it requires ATP to form the cross bridge and then ATP to detach it again and then more ATP to form the next one and, and so on. So as long as action potentials continue to arrive at the sarcolemma, the calcium remains in the sarcoplasm and this process repeats again and again and again as long as we still have that calcium flooding the cell. So then when we don't have an action potential anymore and we want the muscle to relax, um, so the, the motor neurons stop sending an action potential. So we're stopping the signal to contract which means we no longer have acetylcholine being released into the neuromuscular junction. And what is there is getting broken down, just like we talked about in the previous video. So the acetylcholine gets broken down, taken back up by the cell, or it will just drift away out into space. But in any case, there's no more acetylcholine there in the neuromuscular junction, which means that we no longer are triggering an action potential in the muscles. There's no more action potential traveling along the sarcolemma which means that the calcium in the sarcoplasm gets taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so when there is no action potential in the muscle, we take that calcium back up out of the sarcoplasm and put it away to store in the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that we're ready when there is another action potential and we do need to contract again. So the calcium is taken back up, which means that the tropomyosin returns back to its position covering the myosin binding sites and the troponin relatches and holds the tropomyosin in place. Which means, of course, if the myosin binding sites are covered, means that we have no more cross bridges able to form.
And then that's relaxation. And we just stay in that state until there is another action potential and we have a signal to contract. Okay, so in muscle fatigue, that is the inability of a muscle to contract forcefully after ongoing activity. Um, essentially, we run out of resources to sustain any more contraction, or at least a smooth sustained contraction. So we run out of resources in a lot of different ways. Um, so we have fewer calcium ions available to release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So like when we're at rest and we take up all those calcium ions into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to store, if there are less of them to take up, and so we have less stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that means we'll have fewer to flood the cell with when there's the next action potential, which is going to reduce the amount of contraction because we'll have fewer sarcomeres able to respond to fewer calcium ions. Um, and the reason why there's less calcium to take back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum is because when the calcium is in the sarcoplasm, it gradually slowly leaks out through the sarcolemma. So the calcium ions are leaking out from the cell. And so when we want to take it back up to save for later, there's less of it there to store for later. And then it takes time to, for the cell to reabsorb more calcium and, and store it up. Um, at the same time, we're getting depleted of creatine phosphate, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, oxygen, glycogen, and other nutrients, all used in the process of producing ATP, or in, all used in the process of our energy cycles, our Krebs cycles, and in essentially manufacturing ATP so that we can fuel this whole process. So we're running out of all these different nutrients and all these different sources and, and um, resources for energy production. And then our motor neuron on top of that also can run out of acetylcholine. So even if, let's say the muscle fiber has everything it needs to produce a contraction, if the motor neuron sending the signal to the muscle runs out of acetylcholine, then there won't be enough acetylcholine to generate an action potential in the muscle. So even if the muscle's ready and able to respond, there's nothing to respond to without enough acetylcholine. All right, so I wanna talk briefly about lactate versus lactic acid. Uh, so muscle fibers produce lactate as a byproduct of metabolism. That is frequently confused with lactic acid. Uh, what we are producing and what is circulating in our blood is lactate, which is a base, not lactic acid, which is an acid. Um, at the levels we would produce lactic acid, if that were the case, it would not be compatible with life if we were producing that much acid and it was remaining acid in the body. Um, we would become extremely acidic and would not be compatible with life. So thankfully it's actually lactate that's a base. Um, and so we're not becoming acidic from lactate. Uh, so accumulation of lactate, or what is commonly called lactic acid, but mistakenly, has long been thought to cause muscle fatigue and muscle soreness. And that's in big part because both happen at the same time. So muscle fatigue and lactate accumulation occur simultaneously. Now, whether we can demonstrate a causal relationship, like the accumulation of lactate causes muscle fatigue or not, that's debatable. Um, but because they happen at the same time, there's been an assumption, I believe since the 60s or 70s, um, when this was first beginning to be studied, there was an assumption that because they're happening at the same time, it's the lactate accumulation that is causing the muscle fatigue. And that may or may not actually be true. Uh, muscle fatigue also diminishes as lactate is removed from the muscle tissue, which also lends itself to that idea that lactate accumulation is what's causing the muscle fatigue. Um, but recent studies have found that the effects of lactate accumulation on muscle fatigue and soreness are probably grossly overestimated. So in well-designed studies where they sort of isolated the two factors, they found that although they do happen at the same time and maybe lactate accumulation does have some effect on muscle fatigue, probably not nearly what has been assumed to be the case for decades. Uh, lactate accumulation may slightly reduce muscle performance, but not significantly. And that's also very interesting. It's thought, or it's it's been suggested 
um, that lactate accumulation might slightly reduce muscle performance, partly to protect the muscle from overworking. So lactate accumulates as a waste product of muscle metabolism, and it's thought that that accumulation of its waste product helps to protect the muscle from working harder than it should or than is safe for it. Um, and so then it reduces the muscle's performance. So it's not very significant, um, but it is suggested that it could be a protective feature. Uh, the heart is also able to use lactate produced by muscles during physical activity as a fuel source. So cardiac muscle tissue actually will take up lactate from the blood and use it as fuel, um, which is an incredibly efficient system. That's so efficient, such a great way for things to work because as the muscles are working hard and producing this lactate byproduct, the heart is taking that back out of the blood and using it for its own fuel. All right, and then finally, muscle tone. Uh, it's the constant low level activation of a small number of motor units within each muscle of the body. Um, so all of our muscles have muscle tone in a healthy muscle and we have this muscle tone and it's sort of this low level constant activation of the muscle. And I like to think of it as like the muscle is idling, like when a car idles, it's like the muscle is on and it's activating and it's ready to go at any time but it's not enough to cause any sort of motion or, or any activity. So it's just enough to keep the muscle on and responsive and ready to go, um, but we're not causing any movement with muscle tone. And I wanna make sure it's really clear when people talk about like, like they're trying to tone up or they're working out to get more tone, this is not the tone they mean. Um, so in layman's terms, muscle tone, they're just meaning they wanna lose body fat and build more muscle tissue so that you can see the definition of muscles better. In scientific terms, muscle tone has nothing to do with that. This is really just the basic tone of the muscle, the basic activation of a resting muscle. Um, so all of our muscles should always have tone, whether awake, asleep, whatever position we're in, no matter how much we relax, we always have muscle tone. If it doesn't, then that's some kind of paralysis or flaccidity. Um, so that's not ever a good thing. So we want to always have muscle tone. Uh, so motor units are activated involuntarily to produce a sustained minimal contraction when the muscle is at rest. Okay, so if we lay down and just fully rest to our deepest, we will still have muscle tone in all of our muscles of the whole body. Uh, keeps the muscles firm and prepared to contract to a greater extent when needed. Okay, so it keeps the muscles activated. Um, it keeps them idling and ready to go at a moment's notice as soon as the motor control or as soon as the motor command comes from the nervous system telling that muscle that it's time to move or time to contract to a greater extent. Um, muscle tone does not generate movement. So then flaccidity is muscle limbness that occurs in muscle, if muscle tone is lost, uh, caused by neuropathy or some central nervous system dysfunction. Okay, so flaccidity would be some kind of paralysis where we don't have the motor control going to those muscles anymore. So we also wouldn't be able to contract it voluntarily in that case, a flaccid muscle or a paralyzed muscle. Um, we wouldn't have voluntary control over it, but we also don't have involuntary muscle tone going to that muscle when it's at rest. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this video. And I'll see you for the next one.